Today I'm after something common to all of us when we try to forgive. It's an unconditional love. If you ever get your relationship on an even keel, unconditional love, agape, keeps it even. Keeps you from going off the rails. But if you ever go off the rails, hello. No, that's, a, that's an if, first class condition. That's if and it's true. If and you have gone off the rails and if and you will go off the rails and if and you're probably off the rails right now then the way to get back is through forgiveness. Without forgiveness, relationships cannot survive, not, in, not really. I mean, they may stay together. They may actually be together. But as far as thriving and getting to start over, you see, when you forgive someone, you erase their debt. And they get to start over with you. you. The idea is to get all the way back to the place where you started. Now you say, well, I, I know things about them now I didn't know before. Granted, but you have to forgive that stuff too. See, not, we not only have to forgive. God not, not only wants us to forgive the things that are done, but even the character flaws that are the basis of things that are done. Because character flaws, deeply ingrained character flaws, aren't easily changed. Now, it's even more difficult when the person seems to be oblivious to all that and not willing to change. But when you have someone in your life who's open and, and hungry for the Word and willing to look at themselves and change deep patterns, you got the best. That's as good as it gets. It's as good as it gets because nobody has arrived. Nobody. There's still going to be things that you react and you're going to go off the rails and you're going to operate out of old man beliefs and ideas and you're going to produce mental, verbal, or overt sins. It's just the way it works. I mean, this is the, this is the Christian life. Two steps forward, one step back. The goal of maturity is where you can get pretty consistent with all this. You get consistent in the new man. So, let's talk about this. Uh, again, unconditional love operating from the filling of the Spirit, living in the new man. In other words, using new man biblical principles, the same ideas Jesus used, to deal with your life situations, trusting God, letting God handle it, dealing with it from that standpoint. Look, you can stay pretty even in your relationships. If you get to a point where you where you quit letting go of the Spirit and falling back over here again and again and again and again and again. And you confess the same things over and over and over again. In maturity, that begins to ease up and you begin to stay over here more consistently. That's the goal. Listen, the goal is not just to, to assemble a set of rules to choose and live by. The goal is to get all of these concepts and principles seated down into the depth of your heart to become your automatic way of thinking and living and, th and feeling and acting so, so it becomes deep into your subconscious. So you live it out just naturally, effortlessly. But when we, when we let go of the Spirit, we start looking, we, we go back to our selfishness. It's all about me now, how I've been betrayed how I've been harmed, how, how you now owe me. So that's the whole idea of forgiveness. You owe me. So we often find true forgiveness that wipes away the sins of others the way God wipes away ours. Very difficult. If you're honest, you know this. Very difficult. And we do it incompletely or not at all. We do it in word only. Oh, I've forgiven you, but I could cite every single incident that you, <laughs> dates, times, words, it's like you got a recording. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not keep score. Question, are you keeping score? I mean, do you have a list of events and incidents where this person that you're 
we're talking about, whoever it might be, maybe it's uh, several somebodies, you have a list of events and situations where they wronged you, or you feel they did at least. Do you have that list in your mind? Can you see that list in your mind? How about erasing it? How about er just erase the board? Isn't it nice to walk in and see a very, uh, you know, we used to wash the blackboards. The green, they were green, you know, the green blackboard. And you, man, that thing looks so good. You, you hate for the teacher to mark on it. How about erasing it in your mind and getting uh, just a nice, clean white board? How about that? Now, if you'll turn with me to Matthew 18, we're going to look at Peter. Peter thought, <laughs> Peter thought he was going to be on the other end of this deal. Uh, he thought he was going to be the one having to do the forgiving. Apparently he had somebody in his life that was irritating him. Uh, he's already been through the get behind me Satan thing. That's Matthew 16. So, you know, he's, he's already had to be forgiven. And in Matthew 18, verse 21, let's read here if you're with me. Peter came to the Lord and said, How often shall I, my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And this was more than the traditional idea the Jews had. This was Peter's being generous. Oh, he's being a very generous guy, he thinks. I mean, what do you do after seven times? I mean, I guess no holes barred, huh? Look out. I mean, there's going to be a bear trap in the yard or something. Uh, but the Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seven, 70 times seven. In other words, every single time it's necessary until the day you die. Okay, you got that? Indefinitely, all every time. How many times do you forgive your brother when he sins against you? Every time. Every time. No exceptions. No justifications. Oh, you just don't know. Just don't know what they did. How many times they've done it. Well, take it to the Lord. See what he says. Here, here I, I encourage you to just close your eyes and go stand in front of the Lord and say, this person in my life, you just, Lord, only you know how bad they are. And he's going to say, well, look right down there. There's a cross right down there. And let's go look at your sins. That's literally what he's going to say to you. But anyway. And so in order to illustrate this, Jesus gives us a story, a, a parable. For this reason, uh, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents, a huge amount, unpayable. But since he did not have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and the repayment to be made. This was a time of indentured servitude. If you couldn't pay your debts, they could, they could indenture you until you paid them off. The slave then fell down, prostrated himself, saying, please have mercy on me. I will repay you everything. And it says his Lord, the Lord of that slave, felt compassion and released him from the debt. Uh, and for, it released him and forgave him the debt. That's what forgiveness means. It means to release someone from a debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, a small amount. And he seized him and began to, began to choke him and saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down just like he had and began to beg him and say, have patience, I will repay you. And he was unwilling though. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. He indentured him. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. And then summoning, he said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that, that, that debt because you entreated me. 
Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I have had on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handing him over to the torturers, the torturers, the jailers who torture to gain a confession until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father do to you also if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, you can, you can say, well, this was written to, this was said to, uh, in the Old Testament to Jews dealing with the millennial kingdom, and I would agree with you, but the principle remains the same. Because we're talking, we're not talking about dispensations, we're talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, the word afiemi, to release from a debt, is the word forgiveness. The idea being that when someone sins against you, or you at least feel like they have, in your mind, they incur a debt. They owe you. We say, you owe me an apology, right? They owe you. Now, whether that's true or not, in your mind, at least it's true. They owe you an apology, an acknowledgement, or you even expect them to endure some form of punishment from you some form of retribution or vengeance. Forgiveness considers the debt fully paid. Fully paid. Someone has hurt you, someone has slighted you, someone has betrayed you, have left you out, has called you a name, or in a, in a moment of intimate, intimate anger and, and conflict, has said or done something that they normally wouldn't say or do. They they got over all, they got off the rails and they they the old they got back into the old man and it got deep and the, before you know it they called you something and you're like I can't believe you called me that can't believe you said that I can't believe you did that can't believe that now I know that's not ever happened to anybody in this room that's married uh, the question. Uh, let's see, forgiveness considers the debt fully paid and the debtor free to start all over. Do you think that when you confess your sins to God, that he holds some of what you just did against you? Or do you get to rebound and keep moving to start all over? Do you get to start all over with God? All over? I mean, all the way? The board is erased? It is, isn't it? Now... I understand that we have a difficult time getting there with our debts that we're owed. But the goal is to the goal is to get there. The goal is to erase the board of the debt they owe you because of the wrong so that they get to start all over with you without you holding stuff against them. That's the goal. Now, it requires some growth and maturity to get there. It requ Listen, I'll tell you what it requires. It requires momentum for you to be in the spiritual life consistently. If you're not in the spiritual life consistently, there's no way. If you spend 70% of your time in the old man, in the world, materialistic, thinking about your job or whatever, instead of the Lord, walking in the Spirit, you won't have the inner strength and momentum to be able to deal with life that way. None of it. Especially in intimacy. See, intimacy is where, where life really is. It's where the joy of life is. It's where the juice is. It's where everything is. I mean, the people that have often people that have been deeply hurt early in their life, they shut down, they build a stronghold, they build walls around themselves, and they live inside of it so they don't have to feel anything. They go through all the motions of living life, but they don't really live life. They just go through it. They get through it. I'm trying to get through the day. So, no, no, no meaning and purpose there, just getting through it. And that's not what the Lord wants for us. He wants us to be fully Functional. He wants us to be to be open to him and to those that that we love and that love us. So forgiveness is all about that. Now, 
I've broken this little parable down into a couple of different, really three different sections, 23 through 27. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, 21 through 22, the question and answer. Then 23 through 27, the sum, the, the money. Uh, and finally, 32 through 35, the, the retribution here. But 10,000 talents is a huge sum that nobody can repay, no slave anyway. And, and the, the master had every right to put him, indenture him until he paid it off, which would have probably have been the rest of his life. He'd have been a slave all his life. But the, the master, hey, he forgave him the debt. He had compassion. Uh, when he comes to the fellow slave who owed him 100 denarii, which is a small amount, had no compassion or mercy at all. Uh, and then the master gets a hold of him again. After the huge debt I forgave you, didn't you find it necessary to show mercy to your fellow slave as I had showed mercy to you? It says he delivered him to the jailers to be tortured until he should repay. Thus shall the Father do to you if you refuse to forgive your brother from your heart. Now parables, when you, when you deal with parables, you're looking for a main idea. You're not, you can't read into everything. I mean, you can't take every little part of it and say, well, that's this and that's that. You can do it a little bit. I mean, there's common sense stuff here, like who's the master? Master's God, of course. That's the parable. Who's the slaves? That's us. The master forgives us everything, this huge debt from Adam's original sin, because it was paid for on the cross. That way he can forgive us without violating his own righteousness and justice. See, if he just forgives it arbitrarily, he does an unrighteous act, and you can't do that. But he, he would cease to be God, and the devil would win the angelic conflict. So God's definitely not going to do that. Therefore, the payment had to be made. That was the cross. Death had to be defeated. That's the resurrection. Somebody did that for you. The main idea here is that God forgives our sins, and we in turn are to forgive others, just as he forgave us in Christ. Just as. So, God is able to freely forgive our debts because Christ paid for them. He expects us to do the same with all the other people in our life, or he says, suffer the torture. Now, what are the tortures? Do you think God literally is going to turn you over to the, put you in jail because you don't forgive? No, the torture is your own self-induced misery. Just, just my opinion. Your own self-induced misery that comes from living in bitterness. Because when you don't forgive, you automatically start to move into resentment, bitterness, hatred. Listen, self-hatred, all kinds of crazy stuff that are all part of the old man system that you don't have to live in anymore. You can come out of that. You can literally delete that system a piece at a time if you want, but you can definitely, while filled with the Spirit, live free from it. You don't have to live like that. Your, your partners, your friends, your loved ones don't have to live with you like that. That would be a joy. Uh, so, the master's God, the fellow slaves are believers in the Jewish age where they had indentured servitude for unpayable debts. They also had the year of Jubilee. All of this is analogous to God forgiving his children in Christ, but them using legalistic justifications to hold sin and debt against others. We justify the fact that, listen, somebody has a bad pattern. And you're in a relationship with them, and they inherited or developed bad patterns of relating that caused them to react in bad ways, hurtful ways. But here you are with them. And the Lord has put them in your life, and you can't walk away from that. So what do you do? Well, what you don't do is this. You don't build walls between you and them and keep them at hand's length, arm's length. That's what you don't do to protect yourself. You don't do that. You don't do that. 
If you do it God's way, then you forgive that every time, and you even forgive the character flaws of, of developed false, false developed thinking that has become ingrained and habitual in that person so that they react to certain stimuli in a certain way, and it comes out, boom. Now, you say, well, what if they just, they just, won't, they just won't change it? They just won't change it. Look, do you think, do you not think that, that God will enable you to endure that without hiding and running and building these walls between you? You're the one that God has put in their life to help them. You can't do it from behind a wall. See, what you're doing is you're putting yourself above even the will of God in your own, quote, protection. I understand this. I've done it, did it, I've done it most of my life. It's a natural old man defense mechanism, but it's not the will of God. And for those of us who are determined to grow into a maturity, you can't live like that. You cannot live like that and do the will of God. Okay? Can't live like that, keeping people, especially certain intimate people in your life at arm's length to keep them from hurting you again. Listen, God has made you much stronger than that. You just don't know it, and you just don't believe it. You think you're weak, and that if, that, if it happens one more time, I just can't. No, it's not true. It's a lie. We listened to a, fear that, uh, a song this morning on the way home called on the way here, called Fear is a Liar. Fear is a Liar. What a great song. Now, the subject in this is the slave who's been forgiven the huge amount and then turns and refuses to forgive his fellow slave a small amount. And God implements the full weight of available resources to extract payment. The slave's refusal to forgive others winds him up in the hands of the torturers the jailers who torture a confession, it's analogous to self-induced misery in divine discipline. Can't live like that and do the will of God. Paul said, I've come, my, my weapons are mighty to tear down these fortresses, these, these defenses that you've built to protect yourself from life. Listen, you don't need defenses to protect yourself from life. You have God within you to overcome life, to live above it. To live above the sin and the and the betrayal and the hurt. I mean, our government betrays us every single day. Thing called convention of states, where they're trying to put enough states together. That's in the Constitution to grab a hold of those people. I am praying that that happens. And the first thing they do is fire about half of them, or maybe all of them. Peter, let's look at Peter's life in Matthew 26. If you'll turn over to Matthew 26. We've already seen Peter tell the Lord he can't go to the cross. In Matthew 16, and we get to 26, 31, the Lord starts explaining to all the disciples that they're all going to run away. When the soldiers come and arrest me, you're all going to run away. <laughs> and, and they're all like, no, there's no way we're going to run away. That's so funny. Oh, Jesus said, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and sh the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said, even though all of the rest of them fall away, I will never fall away. Jesus said, truly I say to you that this very night before the, before the rooster crows, in other words, the sun comes up and the rooster crows, uh, you will deny me three times. Peter can't believe that. He, listen, Peter's got an image of himself as brave. He's a brave man. He's a loyal man. He would never abandon his friend. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Now, if you go on over to... Verse 69, and Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and this is where you get the denials, and a servant girl confronted him, 
he, in verse 70, he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too are one of them for the way that you talk gives you away. And he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a cock crowed and Peter remembered the word Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now Luke, if you'll turn over with me to Luke 22, just real quick. Luke 22, verse 61 and 62. We find the same incident where Peter is denying him. In verse 60, Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was speaking, the cock crowed. In verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he goes out and weeps bitterly. Man's broken by his own sins and failures. He denies the Lord, determined not to, and yet the overwhelming situation, he let go of whatever spiritual life he had, and he went back to his old man protective system, and he did whatever he had to do to get out of that situation, to avoid ending up with where Jesus was. Self-protection what we do now do you think peter's going to have trouble forgiving himself he is isn't he? because in john 21 he says i'm going to go back i'm going to return to fishing now whether he's just fishing for the day or he's going back to the business he believes at this point and, and again i'm interjecting this i'm looking at it as, as a psychologist what is common the, if, if Peter's following what is common in most people, he's having a difficult time justifying in his mind how God could forgive him. I mean, three times. I don't know the man. I don't know the blankety-blank man. And there he is faced with it, and it just breaks him. It breaks, breaks right through all that veneer, that belief that he's this strong, loyal man, and he realizes how weak he really is. And listen, that's a, that's a difficult realization. Jesus comes to get him. You remember John 21? You know, Peter, do you love me? And all this kind of stuff. Do y'all remember that passage? Where the Lord comes to get him and says, look, dude, time to get back to work. But, 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 no, no buts. You are forgiven. You were forgiven the moment I looked at you. What do you think he saw? What, what look did Jesus give him? Was he mad? Was he like, oh, I'm going to get you, Peter? No. He forgave him. He forgave him, and that's the look he gave him. That's the look he saw. When Peter, the Lord looked up at him, it was like, it's okay, son. It's okay. It's okay. It's it's your it's humanity. It's your humanity. Listen, bad patterns of relating are very difficult to break. They're difficult to break and grow out of. Anybody that attempts it is a courageous person and is worthy of your respect and worthy of your forgiveness. And if you and if and if two people like in a marriage would begin to do that themselves, and work together and help each other, man, that would be an awesome thing. Help each other grow into this spiritual life. What an awesome idea. You think that's what God intended? <laughs> Might be. Huh? You know, no, I think that he just put us together so we could talk about the bills. 
you know, and how much money we're spending and how much we got saved up, you know, how secure we are because of all the money we got. Yeah, boy, that's what that's all about, huh? Principles for life. All forgiveness begins with the master. The father who forgives all our sins judicially at salvation also forgives our, our failures as a parent parentally, 1 John 1, 9, as we, walk, as we seek to walk with him in life. Judicial forgiveness are the sins paid for on the cross and recorded in the courtroom of heaven. Payment is applied at the moment of salvation, resulting in the imputation of divine righteousness. In the courtroom of heaven, at the moment of salvation, you're brought into court. Your sins are all brought out. Your defense attorney, and, the, and you are guilty. There's no question. There's no defense, except your defense attorney stands up and says, yes, they're all true, but they're all paid for in full. And the judge says, done. Wipe them out. Erase the board as far as from the east is to the west. And then you're given the righteousness of God imputed to your very self because you're in Christ and you're in that forever. All It opens all that Christ is and has to you. Not only do you lose all of this, the 13 charges, but you get all of this. You, you don't think you're forgiven? You're forgiven. I mean, you're forgiven. Listen, if you were to go up to God the Father and say, you remember that thing? He would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking, what are you talking about? No, I don't remember that. It's gone. I wiped it out as far as, I put it as far as the east is from the west. I can't even see it anymore. Now, that's language of accommodation. Of course, God knows what you did every single time. He keeps the list, but he forgave it. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, fights, evil speaking. This is what happens when you don't forgive. When you don't forgive and you don't forgive immediately, now, bitterness, wrath, anger, fights, evil, evil words. Let it all be put away from you. With all malice, malice is a desire to hurt. It's a lust to do harm. And, and listen, instead, be kind to one another. It's fruits of the Spirit. So this is walking in the Spirit. This is not a list of rules that you're to uh, implement in your flesh through your will. Walk in the Spirit. Confess this stuff, reject it as a way of thinking and living, reject it, race it out of your mind and, and cling to the Spirit. And you will be able to, to begin doing these things. It will become your new way of life. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even, even as God, for, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Just like he forgave you, forgive others. In Romans 4, 7, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What God has freely given us is the foundation and basis for who we are in Christ. Who we are in Christ determines what we're to be like and how we're to become that. Now, get down to the rub here. The Lord requires that those having received judicial forgiveness and operating in parental forgiveness give the same forgiveness to all the other people in their life. Everybody. Every time. Till the day that you go to heaven. Seventy times seven. In other words, indefinitely. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, if you forget, uh, give others, the Father will forgive you. If you don't, he won't forgive you. There's a principle there that when you refuse to forgive, you live in a place of self-induced misery, of bitterness and wrath and anger and malice. That's a terrible, miserable, torturous place to live. Listen, you think your walls are protecting you, but what they've done is imprisoned you 
in a terrible place. And the only, only life, there is no life in a fortress, in a stronghold. There is no life in there. There's only old man death. I don't care. There is, there is, no, there is no limit to what has been done to you that you're not to forgive. There is no, there is no limit of how many times. There's no limit. If you're going to obey God, you're going to come back to this place where you forgive. Listen, I've done a ton of marriage counseling. This is always the issue. Always. It's not what's been done. It's the fact that one or both stopped forgiving. It just got overwhelming. They said, I can't take it anymore. You're going to have to stay over there. And I'm not going to open my heart back to you, and I'm not going to be intimate with you for real. I'll go through the motions, but you have hurt me too deep, and now I am justified at keeping you at a distance. That's marriage counseling. So much fun. I really enjoy it. Uh, I'm the only one that enjoys it. Uh, Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another. Forbearing. In other words, living with each other's flaws and shortcomings without reacting. Getting to the point where you stop taking all that stuff. Listen, it's an ingrained behavior that they picked up, prob possibly inherited genetically, developed it through their life through imitation, and now it's deeply, it's just a, it's a reaction. Push the button and react. Now that stuff can be broken and removed and must be if you're going to live in the fruits of the Spirit because you'll go back to it every time. Just put enough pressure on you, boom, you're back. You're, you're going to strike out. You're going to get angry. You're going to raise your voice. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to withdraw whatever you do to avoid or deal wrongly with your relationships. You're going you're gonna to go back to it if you don't break the pattern. The, the deal is to break the pattern. We called it a lot of different things. I mean, Wednesday night, Ron talked about, you can't keep going over here. But you say, I don't even intend to go over there. I know. It's a reaction. It's just, a, it's, you've turned it, you've ingrained it so deeply, you've done it so many times that it's just an automatic habit. It's just a habit. You don't really even believe it anymore. It's just a habit that you've not taken the effort and time to break and replace. I call it erase and replace. That's how I deal with it in my life. Forgiveness in intimate relationships can be difficult because undesirable patterns of behavior brought into the relationship on both sides. Hello, both sides are not easily laid aside and replaced. They are old habituated ideas we use over and over until we're uh, until we're willing to break them. Do so you're willing to break the pattern? Romans 6, 16. Turn to Romans chapter 6 real quick. I need to show you this because I say these things and people look at me like I'm crazy. If you look at verse, oh, go to verse 12. Romans chapter 6, start with verse 12. We'll read through verse 16. Therefore, do not allow sin to rule you in your mortal body that you should obey its desires. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. This is old man stuff. Instead, present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be your master, will not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Under law, you couldn't beat this stuff. Under grace, you have the power to do it. What then shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. That's what they accuse Paul of teaching. Just 
Let every, you, no more law. Look, <laughs> this is what legalists believe. If you remove the law, people are now free to do whatever they want to do. Hallelujah. What they don't want to understand is under grace and the love of God motivates you to give that freedom back to him. And yes, when you're a baby Christian, you're going to abuse their freedom. Every baby I ever met did in some way or form or another, either, either through some kind of sinful corruption or religious corruption. But verse 16, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, and he's talking about giving yourself over to sinful behavior motivated by old man thinking, don't you know that when you do that and present yourself to that, to obey either sin resulting in death or obedience resulting uh, in righteousness. I am missing my thing here. In other words, yeah, don't, when you present yourself to sl as slaves for obedience, you become slaves. It ensla when you give yourself over to something, it enslaves you. You know what that means? That means that the more you use an idea in your life, the more natural and automatic it becomes. You just habituate it. So when you use old, when you deal with your relationships from the old man, you just did, you just further ingrain that. In the counseling stuff that I do now, I used to listen to people and let them tell me their whole story, and sometimes I still do, but mostly now I I let them tell a little bit, and then I go, you know, stop, 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 stop. So I'm trying to break the pattern. How many times do you think they've told themselves that old sad story? About a zillion times? They've turned it into their life. This is who I am. So I, I say, stop. Every time you tell that old sad story, you just further ingrain it in your, into your brain, into your heart. I said, let's talk about son, let's talk about answers. Let's talk about God. Let's talk about the new life. Well, let's walk in the newness of life. And they're like, oh, you can do that? I said, look, you can erase that stuff out of your mind just as easy as erasing it off a board. If you'll just do it. Just do it. Every time that stuff comes up and you tell yourself, I'm a slug, I'm unforgiven, I can't be forgiven, I've done too much, I can't. See, that's a lie. And you've got to tell yourself, I'm not going to say that anymore. That's a lie. If you just quit saying all that stupid stuff, you'd quit being, feeling like a, all that stupid stuff. Forgiveness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, the Christian life is about tearing down strongholds and speculation. Speculation is your own idea about how to deal with life. See, all these philosophers, they've come up with these ideas about what life means and what the purpose of it is and how to live it apart from the Lord. We break old patterns of behavior. In Romans chapter 7, Paul says, the things that I want to do, I can't do. I find myself not doing. It's, that's just ingrained habits. Finally, rather than forgive repeated hurtful behavior in others, especially when we're trapped in intimacy, we often judge and rebel against God by building strongholds, justifying our own sin reactions, which is to withdraw, keep people at arm's length, using the pain we have suffered as our justification and telling ourselves, I must protect myself. It's all a lie. It's all a false system. It's a whole false system. It's instinctive. It's natural to do. The more you do it, the more natural it becomes. The more you, it's more difficult it gets to get out of it. But look, if you're going to do the will of God, you've got to turn and reject that stuff. That is not God's will. God's will is for you to forgive that person, not only the sins they've committed, the wrongs they've done, but the flaws and character thinking behind it and pray for them and encourage them to break those patterns so that they can live free from it and hang on to the Spirit. That's, that's your job in that relationship, is to help them. You can't help them if you're all over there bundled up and 
withdraw. Can't do it. You become part. Listen, you just, you just convince them that they're right, that they can't be forgiven. Because you won't forgive them. You won't come back to the relationship. You won't open your heart back up to it. Listen, God will protect you. You don't need to protect yourself. Open your heart and take the arrows and the hurts, and you'll discover that you're tough enough to take that. Listen, you did it with your kids joyfully and gladly. Do it with the rest of us. Do it with the rest of us. Now, that's, that's an admonition. That's called a corrective discussion. Pointing out a problem, something we all commonly do, and the solution is to look to the Spirit and look to God and the promises of God. And when these bad patterns jump up into your life and take over, you recognize it as something that must be removed and broken. It can be removed. It can be broken in your life. Don't think that you're stuck with it. Anyway, hope that's helpful to you. I hope it's encouraging. I hope it's a an admonition. Let's go to the Lord. Father, it's, it's a great privilege to be put in front to speak for you. And I, I think that these words have reflected your view. Perhaps not, perhaps my conviction is not yours, but I, I pray that you allow the people to see through that and hear the truth of it. That forgiveness is not an easy thing. And there's a lot involved. But we fail at our relationships, Father. We fail to live them out fully when we don't forgive. We don't let that other person start all over. We don't get back to, to square one to the love that we started with, to the enjoyment we started with. We don't ever get back to that because we let each other's failures build up in our hearts. We don't ever clean it out and clear the decks and start over. And I pray for us, Father. I pray because it's out of this, this has to happen before we can live in the Spirit. And it's living in the Spirit that's going to be our witness. Our whole witness out to the world from this church is going to, has to be lived from the Spirit. And we can't live in the Spirit if we're all stuck in a stronghold somewhere protecting ourselves. I pray, Father, that we would find the courage, that we could see this truth, find the courage to come out of there, those places and live openly and freely and love, love fully. Love fully, Father. Let's let love flow through us fully to others. I pray all this, and I do pray for the offering. I pray for it in Christ's name. Amen.